Hey everyone, I'm Tammy Sollenberger, the author of The One Inside, 30 Days to Your Authentic Self. This podcast is for anyone curious about who they are, the different parts of themselves, and for those who want to connect with their true self. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Hey, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to season four of the One Inside podcast. I'm so excited to talk to Dr. Allison Cook. Allison is a friend of mine and parts of me weren't sure about doing season four, Um, but Allison had a new book coming out and I thought it'd be great to start with someone that I feel so comfortable with and just excited to talk to her. So let's get going. Enjoy. So I am with my special friend, Allison Cook, who's been on the podcast before talking about her first book, Boundaries, I was going to say For the Soul, or is it Of the Soul? For Your Soul. For Your Soul. I was like, wait, what is it? And you have a new book out, um, and we thought, well, hey, let's let's get together and chat about your new book. Um, So first of all, let's start with a question that I ask everybody, because you're in a different place right now. So tell everybody where you are in the world and what you see when you look out your nearest window. Well, right now I'm in a hotel in Dallas. So I see um, skyscrapers when I look out my window and it's a very surreal experience because I've only been here once before. Yeah. Are you going to do anything fun? Like, are you going to do anything fun or like eat any fun Texas food while you're there? I hope so. I have a good friend who lives here. So I'm going to try to see her and she's from here originally. So I hope I'll get the, the real lay of the land. Yeah. I like that. Not some touristy place. Yeah. 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 So tell me, um, what's the name of your new book and tell me, uh, what's it been like to write it, write something new (laughs) and different and on your own. Yeah, it's called The Best of You, Break Free from Painful Patterns, Mend Your Past, and Discover Your True Self in God. And it is, so my first book was really about IFS. Oh, it was sort of a faith for folks who come from some sort of faith background. It was like, here's IFS and here's your faith and they're not incompatible. You can take this book and integrate it if you're a person of faith, whatever faith. This book is much broader. It's more of sort of a therapy in a book. Again, kind of trying to help. A lot of times, I don't know, Pam, if you relate to this or the folks who are listening relate to this, but like, it's like people feel like if they're part of any faith community that that it's like, I have faith or I can do therapy. You know, I can trust God or I can work on myself. And so everything I'm trying to do is like, actually it could be both. You don't have to, you know, you can still be a person who has faith and who maybe goes through some certain spiritual practices. And also you bring in what psychology has to offer. So this book really goes through kind of the what my experience is of sort of all the different things that we learn about codependency, boundaries, childhood wounds, trauma, and just kind of a, a little journey through what it would look like, you know, what a kind of therapeutic process looks like incorporating some of that spiritual component. I love it because it makes it, um, when I read your book, I thought, um, I loved when you asked questions and you answered the questions. So I, I felt like it was a journey for people that are struggling with both. Like, how do I hold both? And then you were yeah. kind of anticipating what questions they might have and then giving really understandable answers that I think that anybody could understand like it wasn't so kind of high level that people wouldn't be able to understand whether it's yeah. psychologists or you know people that are um, strong in their faith like I feel like both people could really relate and get what you were saying yeah thank you thanks for reading it early too yeah it was <laughs> it was fun to kind of anticipate the questions the skeptical parts of people right you know like because I because the first chapter is like what do you want and it's like the value of asking yourself what do I want because so many of us especially women don't that feels selfish two parts of us you yeah. know and so that was the very first thing so I go through this whole thing what do I want and then it's like the first thing people will say is that feels selfish okay so let's deal with what that really means and how what is selfishness what is what I call you know in IFS we call it self I'm calling it selfhood where it's not about being selfish, but it's also not about denying the self, you know, it's, it's this sort of broader, um, deeper thing. So, right. And that's something that I think people could feel is contrary, right? Jesus says, Mm -hmm. deny yourself. 
And then mm-hmm. psychology is all about focusing on yourself or your mm-hmm. ego. So, and then people might find that they're either in one camp, it's a polarized, it can be such a polarized world for, for exactly. people in those camps. And so I love that that was your first, that was your, your first sort of sell is mm-hmm. like, you know, what, in IFS terms, I would say sort of like, what are the parts of you that are, are going to kind of, um, I don't want to use this word, but sort of kind of resist the information in this book. Totally. A hundred percent because you've been taught, especially if you're coming out of some sort of faith community, self is bad. You should deny yourself, you know? And I remember we talked about this actually on our first episode, we, you know, we, we, both of us had a little bit of that self is bad, you know, and then you get into the IFS world and it's self, it's, it's all about self, but it's not about self in that sense of self-centeredness, selfishness. It's about the fact that, and so that, yeah, exactly. That was the whole thing. It's like, I had to kind of meet the protectors of folks that are like, I've been taught that I shouldn't think about myself, that I shouldn't consider myself, that I should disregard myself. And it's sort of like, well, actually, no, you have to bring yourself. That's all we have to bring into our relationships is ourself. And if we're bypassing ourselves, what are we showing? The only thing we're showing up with then in our relationships is our ways of managing people or controlling people or pleasing people. We're not actually bringing who we really are into our relationship. I love that. And if we're, if we're honest, we are still being very self, you and I keep using hand quotes, selfish, (laughs) because if I'm, if I'm just pleasing you, there's, there's a part of me that's doing that. And there's a reason. And to be honest, it's a selfish reason. If if I'm going to say, I'm pleasing you so that you don't get mad at me. A part of me pleases you. So you don't get mad at me. And then I don't feel anxious because you're mad at me. Okay. So tell me that that's not self-focused, right? So I'm exactly. feeling a little bit, there's a kind of, kind of a cynical part coming up. I'm kind of yelling now. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, what is this part of me that's sort of, you know, kind of arguing kind of against this idea of like, kind of like, who are you fooling thinking you're not focused exactly. on yourself? Um, is there a part of you that has been in settings in which that has been, that's what I'm wanting to know because it is, you do, you start to get, get a little revved up. Like, wait a minute, isn't that, a form of, and I actually get into that. I say like this whole thing about deny yourself. What if that means, what if some of our most selfish parts are the parts of us that want to get everybody to like us? Yes. And yeah. so what if it's a little bit about learning to differentiate from those parts that are so well-trained to please other people, to produce for other people, to perform for other people, um, to, to get a healthy distance from them. So that, I mean, is that, isn't that possibly what Jesus meant? so that we can connect to the truest part of ourselves that might need to be brave, that might need to set a boundary, that might need to say something that someone else doesn't like. You know, it, it, that is actual self. Um, but it is, it's really nuanced for people, especially if you've grown up in any sort of environment in which that idea of it, we should always be selfless. Yeah. We should always, you know, um, it can really, really do a number on people. Right. And I think the thing that um, that's coming up for me as we're talking is that, you know, it, it, when, when we have parts that either don't let us see that, it's sort of like, like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, maybe I have a part because sometimes this idea of like, what do I need? Like, and it's sort of mm-hmm. like, I don't know because mm-hmm. I have parts that don't let me either see that or feel that if, mm-hmm. if it feels safest for me to like, let's say, make you happy. Like that's, that's, you know, that's how I keep my world safe. Let's say is mm-hmm. to make you happy. And so mm-hmm you know, if my managers are working so hard to keep you happy and make you happy, then it's almost like these other parts of me create something, I'm sort of using my hand in front of me, that that creates something so that I don't even know or see or feel my own needs. Because if I was to know what I needed, then I would now have a problem because there's what I need and then there's what you need. And now there's there's, uh, that feels really bad. So I, th- I think that that first chapter is so important because what happens to us when we say, what do I want? What do I need? And all mm-hmm. kinds of parts, I feel like come up with that question. Yes. So many parts. And also the other thing that's interesting about those questions is different parts of us need, di- need more on different things. 
right? So the manager part of me, what I need is for everybody to like me, <laughs> you know? And then you've got the, the tender, you know, the exile that's like, what I need is some attention for my, you know, for me, yeah. you know, and those things then are in conflicts, which is why it's so important to pay attention. Okay. So, you know, you think what you need for the manager part is for everybody to like you. I, you know, and we have to lead ourselves. That's where the, you know, is that what you really need? It's what you thought you've needed. It's maybe what you've needed to survive long ago, but is it really what you need anymore? And so you have to do that negotiation with the manager to get to actually the exile that's like, what I really need is for some time just with myself, with you, you know? You, yeah. um, I just did this, like I took three days off, you know, cause I'm in the middle of this book launch and I had, it was like all the manager parts were like, you should be working. You should be pleasing people. You should be doing, you know, and it was like, it just took like a day to kind of get down to, oh, wait a minute. What's at the root of it all? Which is where the real need is, which is what I really want is just to step back for a minute and be with those tender parts of me that are scared, that are tired, you know, whatever they, whatever the thing may be. But um, it is, it's, it's, it's very spiritual work. It's very, um, it, it, to, Again, I think in IFS, what, what, it, what drew me to IFS was the self, was like, oh my goodness, here's a place where we get to have a self. <laughs> and the self is the best part of us, which is what, when in the best of you, that is what I mean by the best of you. The best of you is self. The best of you is you leading all these parts of yourself. Yeah. Um, but it was just something I was never taught, never taught uh, how to have, how to be, how to inhabit a self. Yeah. I love that. Um, do you find that, I, I feel like this conversation is coming up with me and all my clients and, and in consultation all the time lately about self. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting when we have these themes that show up. And so this is the theme that's shown up a lot um, about either parts not trusting self um, mm -hmm. and you know, when parts get in front of self, it's sort of like, who are you? Where have you been? Um, yeah. And really, and then being angry at self, like where, have, like sort of where have you been? And, and, and then people asking a lot about how do I inhabit self? Um, mm -hmm. So what do you think about either one of those? Like, what do you advise? I, I love that you brought that up because I literally had that happen to me during this three days off. Oh. And I've never really had that happen. I've had it happen with clients, but there was a part of me that I know very well, but that was like, to, to self, you betrayed me, right? And I was just like, I was hiking actually. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Um, and, and then my intellectual part came in and was like, wait, did self betray you? Or did another part of me that you're mistaking for self betray? But that's an intellectualizing part. So that wasn't right. really helpful because the part didn't care. The part felt like it was me. Yeah. Yeah. That's so the that first place self. we go to, right? Like, who do yes. you see that? Who do you think is self? Who do you, who are you looking at? Cause you're yes. not looking at self. You're looking at another part. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's what was so interesting is I had to meet the part where the part was, which is it thinks that itself, I, I'm pretty sure it's another part of me that stepped in, but that part of me really needed. So I just honored it. I was honored. I was like, I get it. You feel like I betrayed you. I get it. I just, that's how I worked yeah, with I that like part it. in that moment. I didn't try to force the part to realize, no, 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 it wasn't me. It was another part, <laughs> you know, yeah. that, it, it's just like, you, I get it. You feel like I betrayed you. That's your experience, you know, and that's, that's kind of what I would do with a client, but it was weird to, to with myself, because every part of me wanted to be like, but it wasn't me, it was this, you know. Um, but so it is. Yeah, so what happened then? Do you mind me asking, like, what happened then? So you're yeah. on the hike, which I love that. Like, I love going for hikes yeah. in our parts, just we just oh, have yeah. lots of good dialogue with our parts. So you say that, you're like, okay, you're not going to do that thing, which I love that. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to say, okay, and does the part tell you more about its feelings mm -hmm. of being betrayed? And oh, yeah, mm -hmm. you betrayed me, and I and lots of flashes of memory of the places. And and I got it. I was like, I get it. I know all of those memories. I know all of those stories. And then there was inside. I was just, I, I think it is self energy to be like, I'm going to let, I'm going to take this. And this is what I wonder a little bit to, to bring this to, for, you know, to the faith thing. I wonder if this is a little bit of what God does when we're angry with God. I get it. I, he doesn't, he can hold our anger, even if logically it's like, well, 
God didn't do this because if we believe God is love or God is good, but it's kind of that energy. It was like, I can take, I can hold this for you. <clears throat> and that's what that part needed. It didn't want me to persuade it that it was another part. It was like, this is what it felt. You know, it's like, I get it. I, 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 I see those moments. And then there was another little part to me, part of me off to the side that was like, oh, that's so interesting. That other part of me was using these coping strategies you know, I, I was kind of aware of that, but this part of me that was so hurt didn't know yet, didn't know that yet, and really needed me to hold that pain. So next session, when I'm on my next hike, I was, I will probably try to see if I can bring the two together, because one was really hurt, it had a different agenda, and then the other one that was betraying this, you know, I think parts betray parts for sure, Yeah. you know? because they have different agendas but it wasn't the time the time in that moment was just to bear witness to this pain it was it was really intense i was like man okay <laughs> but it, it seems like the right you know the way to be with this part was to let the part unload it on me because the part felt like i was safe i love it right and in that idea too that it's unloading this is so beautiful right it's unload it doesn't trust you it's mad at you and it feels like you it you betrayed it mm -hmm. And it's telling you it's yeah. pain because yeah. it feels like you're safe. And so there's this beautiful healing that's happening just there. You can imagine it like a child that, you know, it really is that whole metaphor. If your your kid is so mad and they're like, you know, just mad at you, mad at you. And you're just like, I know that they're not really mad at me, but they just need to be mad. So I'm just going to sit here and hold them. Mm. You know, that's what it feels mm. like. And it is, it is so deeply Oh, it's love, you know, it is that healing component. And then that part, and then I understood it because I was trying to get the part to do something. Another part of me was, and, and, and then what I realized was it was another part of me that was trying to get this part to play ball. And it was like, no. And I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. Okay. I get it. I hear you. I, I didn't quite understand how deeply you felt betrayed. You know, and then those parts that, you know, they just kind of, they're like, okay, maybe, maybe I'll, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm open now to a different perspective, you know? Yeah. Well, because they were, right, it's going to be open because it felt you. And that's the idea. It's like when the parts of us feel the best of us, which is self or that divine in us, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then there is going to be more open. There is going to be more space mm -hmm. because it felt you. Trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. It's amazing work. It is. So going for a walk it sounds like mm -hmm. was a beautiful way of having some self access. What about what else has been helpful in the middle of book launching and you mm -hmm. started a podcast, which is fantastic mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. rich with information. I was like, this must take you forever to do these podcasts. <laughs> It's they're packed full of information and they're, they're fantastic. Um, what has been helpful for you just to reconnect to mm -hmm. the best of you, to your mm -hmm. authentic self? Mm -hmm. This, I have to take, I'm learning the, the more I do, the more I have to, it took me three days to detox. That's what I would say from work, from data. And I have to, thankfully we have this place, um, this cabin in the mountains that literally is off the grid. I cannot bring myself, like there's no cell tower. And I don't think if I had that, I, it, because it takes so much willpower. Um, so we go regularly and I can just log off. And that's when all the, the parts, and I, and I will say I've noticed there's a rhythm of, you know, about every few months, if I get those three days to just kind of let all the protectors have their say, you know, and then I can get to the, the root. Um, I think that when I'm writing and producing so much, I don't know if you feel this way, Tammy, but you can get into those intellectualizing parts. So I can be like, oh, that's a codependent part of me. I, I talk a lot about codependence in the book, but that's not actually connecting to that part. That's just an academic endeavor. And that's what I've really learned is I was like, oh, writing about things, talking about things doesn't take the place of actually doing the work of stepping back and connecting in to those parts. Well, I love that. And then we'll, we'll, let's talk about codependency, but I love that because that's how IFS is different. We're not just talking yeah, about no. my productivity. You and I share 
we're the same Enneagram types. We share yeah. this productivity thing. So I'm not just talking about, I'm like, oh, I'm noticing it was sort of, but it's like, I'm being with, right? There's this part of me that I'm being with. And that's what IFS is so different. And that's the idea of self and why the best of you is so different than other like self-help or inspirational books. Exactly. It's like, how do I be with my codependent, my parts that struggle with codependency, how do I be with them and not just learn about them That's or right. learn about why right. they do what they do? It's I'm being with them. And that's it's, a completely different game. It's completely different. We can analyze, we can, we can even have an accurate analysis of ourselves, And it's not actually getting to the root of the healing and the care that we need. And that's where, yeah, like I am like, I am aware that I am blended with a completely overproducing part right now. Okay, you know, it doesn't mean anything. I can, t- you know, I can t- say that, but I haven't actually, but I, for me, what I'm learning in this season of a lot of productivity, <laughs> I have to, and it is hard for that part of me. Ooh, does it not like it? You know, for me to say, we're going offline. We're going offline for a couple of days. No, no producing. Um, it takes it a day to tell me all the reasons why this is a terrible idea. And then the second day, it kind of relaxes. And then it starts. And then the more I've trained myself to do this periodically, the more that part of me is like, okay, the world doesn't fall apart. Oh, actually, I get insight. Oh, actually. And, and of course, the, product, the productive part of me is like, oh, this is great. Write this down so we can you know, get getting real insight now. So now we can use this. And I'm like, you know, listen, that's fine. But <laughs> at least I'm getting a little rested. Yeah. You know, I'm getting a little distance from you. But boy, and then it gets excited that those three days away are actually like, creating more like like oh boy those parts oh my gosh yes I'm just resonating (laughs) with that so much (laughs) I went on a silent retreat a year ago in October and the second day I started writing another book (laughs) totally it's like it's just like you have a day of silence and your 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 Instagram tree parts like awesome let's go we got a new book now and it's like oh my gosh dear child and you can just picture them a mind feels like a teenager just mm. full of energy, full of them and bigger, just go, go, go. And honestly, I'm like, man, I can't keep up with you anymore. <laughs> like, you yeah, I know I'm down. old. I'm getting too old. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I, lo- and I love that, that it's like, you know, part of me is like, yeah, if you rest, this is my you know productive part. Like, yeah, if you rest, then we're actually even more productive. Right? <laughs> like- <laughs> <laughs> but it is part of that internal negotiation. It really is. I yeah. mean, I think that's part of that's what, one of the things that's helped me about the Enneagram is like, okay, this is this part of me is very close to home. Yeah. Um, and it's not self and it can it can become I wouldn't I wouldn't it's not self self selfish in that sense, but it can become self um, it can become absorbed in its productivity and get disconnected either from the goal, the vision or the mission, which is actually to bring healing resources to people. You know, yeah. um, and yeah. it can also get disconnected from other parts of me. But ironically, that productive part of me is the part of me that was angry with me. It, it one, I think it was an offshoot of that part because that was the part of me I tried really hard to silence all through childhood, all through because I had another part of me that was conditioned into me that was like it's better to stay in the background and to be service minded. Um, and so those, so that's where kind of that codependence conflict inside of me. I have one part of me that's trying to, has a strategy. It's more like my two wing has the strategy of, um, we should only be available to other people. Yeah. Helping, helping others. Yeah. And then the productive part of me is, has the strategy of we should end. Woo. You know, it takes a little while to, to help both of them kind of relax. Yeah, Allison's using her hands to sort of separate out, right? It takes a while to realize that, and I think this is such a good point, those parts feel like me, right? It feels like me, productive, helping everybody. That feels Mm -hmm. like me because that's been the parts that have driven my bus for so long. So without unblending and doing this work, then you know, those, those parts can easily feel like that's who I am. Like the best of me is productive and helping you. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's mm-hmm. actually not the best of me, actually. Mm-hmm. No, no, it's not. It's not their parts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell, let's talk about how, what you just said about um, the, and I, I apologize for people that don't know the Enneagram, but you said 
the, the three part of you and the two part of you that they are codependent. Well, that's an interesting. I wonder if they're codependent with each other. I never thought about it that way. I, they, they get, they get tangled up with each other because they have different ways of essentially um, hyper focusing on other people. So, so how I in in the book how I talk about codependency is it's bypassing myself to focus on other people. So I'm I instead of doing my own work, instead of um, staying connected to my core sense of self, I'm going to bypass that in order to always stay focused on you. And I have two different parts of me that have different agendas for how to do that. And ironically, when I when I work with those two parts, and so that's that's kind of this cocktail of codependency I talk about. They're fueled by my own wounding. They're fueled by things, messages I was taught that it's that you should only focus on other people. So these these parts are very emboldened, very empowered. They feel like this is the right way. You should never think about yourself. You should never take time off. You should only focus on other people. But they have different ways of how they try to do that. And so for me, the work of unblending from them and rec and having them each realize, first of all, they're kind of still to this conversation we just had, like, wait a minute, like, you mean we're not, you know, we're not self. Oh, you mean, and then what's really mind blowing for both of them is from a, if you think about it from a codependency angle, you mean we also need help? we also sometimes need you know that's very foreign for them for me to let, let alone the exile underneath but for me to each give each one of them that attention man you are working so hard you know you're you know that that validation of what they're doing because they're trying to help mm -hmm. you know and they've been taught that this is what they're supposed to do you in one of your podcasts i think as the codependency podcast you talked about how we think of codependency as one thing, but it's really, you define it differently. I do think of codependency as a bypassing of self in the sense of it's, it's parts kind of taking over, taking over the bus. And um, instead of, and, and, and the way they do that is by hyper-focusing on someone else to feel valuable, but it is a, it is a disregarding or a betrayal of the parts of you that need your attention. Um, I don't think, feel like I'm getting it as pithily as you probably heard me say it before. No, I think I think you're doing a, a very great job um, doing it pithily. <laughs> that was a good word. That's a good word. Can you I turn like it. it into an adverb? I think it was good. I think it's a good word. This is what you said. I just remembered it. It was something about how, you know, that word comes out of 12 step. It comes out of 12 step oh, movement. Yeah. And you talk about how I think it the impression that I got was sort of in a family. The idea is we sort of need, you know, the so my family systems background is going to come in here, but we need the identified patient to stay the identified patient. And that's part of the codependency is right. I need that. I need that. And, and the family dynamic in the family circle, I need the identified patient to stay that way. And mm -hmm. so my codependency is actually kind of rooted, the parts of me that are codependent are really rooted in keeping that identified patient as the identified patient. Yeah. So you have this idea, I talk about, um, in the book, I talk about sort of the contract of a codependent relationship. And that's probably what I was getting into where you've got sort of the, to use the family systems word, your words, um, the identified patient, you've got the person in the, in the 12 step model where you've got the person who has the addiction. Um, and maybe they look like the needy one or the problem one that you build your world around kind of, you know, picking up their broken pieces, making sure they stay healthy. And so you look like the supportive one or the good one or the helper, right? And so it's confusing, but really what's happening there is how I believe both people are disconnecting from self. So this is the contract. The contract is I won't, you know, I won't call out what I see in you. And then, but the helper is also really finding their sort of, um, the one who's helping in this situation 
is really finding their self-esteem is finding their, um, they're getting something from it in yeah. return. Yes. Right? Their worth or they're feeling loved or feeling needed. Yes. 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 Yeah. And so those people actually have to take a step back. And when I talk about this idea of a contract of a codependent relationship, I mean, all relationships, right? Every relationship we're in, man, I bring my stuff in, your partner brings their stuff in. That happens. And you might even, even the stereotypical thing, where maybe you have a contr really controlling person and a really soft-spoken, timid person. That doesn't necessarily become a codependent relationship if both people come to the table and say, man, I'm going to struggle because I'm going to want to dominate. I've got this controlling part of me. And then the other one says, I know it's hard for me to speak up. That's going to be hard for me. And each person takes responsibility for, listen, I'm, if I'm the timid person, it's my job to learn how to make myself seen, how to make my needs known. That's my work. And the controlling persons, you know, these, these stereotypical components of a, of a codependent relationship. But, and so I think what happens is whatever the nature of that codependency, it's not so much about the archetypes or the personalities. It's about the way the two people come together. And in the codependent relationship, it's essentially saying, I'm not, we're going to, we're going to make this pact with each other that we're not going to call out. We're not going to name what's happening here. I'm not going to name what I see you doing over there with your addiction or whatever it is. And I'm not going to name the fact that you are essentially completely abdicating the rest of your life to service me to you know we're not going to name those two things and so that's where it gets really unhealthy when you start to heal that relationship it's hard because both people both people not just one or the other both have to be willing to go oh i've contributed to this i've got to turn back toward myself and figure out what is going on here that caused me to completely kind of leave myself to focus on you what wound is there beneath me? What parts of me decided that was the best way to stay safe? And sometimes it's harder to see that. Being on more on that end of the codependency spectrum, that's that's been harder for me to go, oh, that's my part. Yeah, yeah. In that. Yeah, right. Because if you're the like like identified like good one, yeah. right? Like yeah. I'm the good yeah. one. It's all that's your right. fault. You know, that's I don't right. have any parts like that. But no, I mean the, <laughs> the those parts are harder to identify. And then um yeah, I mean, that's been interesting for me in my own life is really identifying that like, okay, wait a minute. Um, you know, there's this, there is a lot of pieces for me that I need to look at too. And a lot of parts of me that I need to look at that contributed, contributed to this, you know, unfortunate, mm -hmm. you know, messy situation. And so, mm -hmm. um, and I think going back to the beginning of our conversation, those you know, when, when we're like, oh, we're the nice girl or we're the nice guy or we're the good girl, the good guy, and we just are helpful. And, and, you know, I have no needs. Um, then, then it is sometimes maybe harder, harder to look at, like, what am I contributing to this, yeah. you know, unhealthy relationship or to a relationship that isn't going well? Um, yeah, yeah, I love that. And I mean, we have to be careful because when people are in abusive, toxic situations, obviously you cope, you survive, and there's no shame in that, right? Of um, course, right. And and I want to I want to give that caveat. There's no, sh I mean, sometimes that's just that's survival. You have to do it. I'm talking more broadly, you know, about habituated patterns of behavior that we haven't named. So for me, I tell the story in chapter three of when I met my now husband, but at the time we'd been dating, and I mean, he just called. He was just like. He was not impressed with my, I just keep the focus on you parts. He was like, uh, this is annoying. Like, I don't want to marry somebody who wants to center their world on me, you know? And I mean, it hurt. And I, those parts of me took themselves to be righteous, you know? Yes, like, yes. What are you, what, what are you talking, you know? Like, I, yes. it, I could have very easily at that point in my life, I could have almost said, well, those parts of me were so close to thinking they were, home, you know, the right it was hard. And when I had to kind of peel back and go, oh my gosh, is there something to, because this is me being a good, nice person yeah. by always only catering to you. And so when he, he basically was like, I, this is kind of a problem for me in our relationship. It hurt. You know, those parts of me did not like it. And then I had to get to the root. And of course, shame enters in because the reality was underneath that was this part of me that was desperate to be seen, desperate 
to be visible, but was also about six years old. Mm. And so then you have to, how do you be seen as a six year old when you're, you know, 35, you know? Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you have to go do that work of, oh my gosh, this is the way that I have learned to cope for much of my life. And I didn't even know, and I'd done IFS work at that point, you know, it was just so, when you go into a relationship at all, but it, you know, it was like, <laughs> yeah. that's my journey, my journey. <laughs> was, you know, relationships bring it all out. You know, yeah. it was like, that was my journey to go, oh my gosh, I have to learn that all this way I've learned to be seen and be validated by focusing on others. I have to actually learn a different way, which is letting those vulnerabilities be seen. And unfortunately for us, some of those vulnerabilities are, it's wobbly when it comes out as an adult. It's like, I should be past this. I shouldn't, I should be more mature than this. It's like, so we have to really be tender with ourselves. But I think that for me underneath that codependency was a lot of shame. It was like, how do I show up and be seen? I don't even know how to do that. And it's going to look really weird, yeah. you know, yeah. because it's so new. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that work needed to happen inside of me before it could even bring into the light of day with another human. Yeah. Um, right. It needed to happen inside of you with you, like mm -hmm. those parts meeting you and talking to you and you hearing their stories about where they yep. learned to do that, especially yep. when you've been doing something that seem that is seemingly good, right? I'm listening yes. to you. I'm being all about you. Yes. And I've been doing yes. that for 35 years. So then I'm, you're in this new relationship and you're like, wait, what? Like, yeah. no, and then that is... also, that also can feel like you, well, that's who I am. So if that's who I am yeah. and not recognizing that, no, that's a part of you. And so that's a part of yeah. me that yeah. has these burdens. And then when I get that part of me in front of me, then I can yeah. find out what's going on and, and find out that that part of me is, is protecting a six-year-old and yeah. unburdened. And then is, then you're sort of like, okay, that's beautiful and lovely and, and great. But then there's also this sort of like, then how do I do relationships? Because exactly. I've been doing relationships this one way for a uh, long time. <laughs> exactly. No, that's why you realize it is really precarious. Adulthood <laughs> is really precarious because any of those, you know, and then sometimes it's, well, this was just easier. It's been working. So I'll just keep doing it that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or you do the work inside yourself and you begin to realize, but then you've got to figure out how to bring that kind of wobbly, you know, I, I love the the idea of fawning, you know, as, a, as one of the survival responses, because it feels exactly like that. It's like, you feel like that kind of wobbly, like fawn, that, that young, tender thing that like, how do I actually bring this into an adult relationship where it's not somebody's job to hold me with kid gloves, but this is tender. Yeah. It's, so to it's help, not for the faint of heart. Yeah. No, no. I don't know if we should do them at all, actually. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there's a part of me that's been saying, this is what's really been helping me. And I want to talk about fawning. Um, but what's been really helping me is if you want something different, then you need to do something different. That's been a manager. My manager has been saying that if you want something different, you okay. need to do something different. And that helps the parts of me that are like, we've been doing it this way for 30 years. And so now we want something different. And so and then we're like, okay, well, this is how we do relationships. And then this little voice, the really sweet voice that says, well, if you want something different, you have to do something different. And that's mm -hmm. been really helpful for me to be really looking at, you know, my own stuff. Um, and I think that's been helpful um, because it I is hard, that. right? Like, so, and it's really, and it's a gentle, really sweet voice. Um, and then reminds me that I do oh. want something different. So if I show up with the same parts that are yeah. <laughs> burdened, then you can just end up with the same thing, which you don't want. So tell everyone what fawning is. Well, so we know that people are familiar with the fight flight response, right? The, that's what most people know where we move into sort of the fight or the flight. And then there's the, the freeze where we freeze. And then this fourth one that Pete Walker um, in his book on CPTSD identified, he calls it the fawn response. And I really love that. And I think it applies a lot, especially to women. It certainly applied to me where you get conditioned to, there's a conditioning that occurs. It's not fighting. It's not fleeing. It's, it's actually proactive, but it's like, if I can essentially take care of everybody around me. It's a survival response. I can stay out of the fray. I can um, not get in trouble. I can be liked. I can get my needs met. And I will do that by taking care of everybody around me. And it's very adaptive. People like it. It's, it's these nice good girl parts. You know, these 
but it's a conditioned trauma response. You know, I mean, yeah. it's coming from not getting your needs met as a child. So instead of your child, you've got that young part of you, you know, let's say there's violence in your home, you know, your parents are fighting with a sibling or your parents are fighting with each other. You're hurt by that. You're anxious. You're observing that. But instead of you saying, man, this was hard for me. And, and that wise parent coming to you and saying, that was hard. Let's name that. Let's talk about what happened. That's not happening. Instead, you're going, okay, what do I do to make sure this doesn't happen again? So you start being the person managing everybody so that they don't fight. That's fawning. And you learn to do it and it works because people tell you, you're such a good girl. You're so helpful. You make it all better. People stop fighting, you know? Yeah. And this, yeah. so you take this into your adult relationships. Yeah. I manage everybody else because then I don't have to deal with the chaos of conflict. But the problem is you're not getting your, you know, the parts of you that were, are actually in need are not getting their needs met. And that to me is sort of the root, the cocktail, as I call it, of codependency of what we see in that adult pattern of behavior. It's learned. Yeah, I um, love and that. And it works. It's a survival response and it works as a kid, but it's not so healthy for your adult relationship. <laughs> yeah. And I love that when we think, you know, it's so, it's so simple in some ways that it's like, okay, I learned to do that at six. So I learned to do that at six. And so really it's my six-year-old still doing that, right? Like it's, you know, a six-year-old protector and a six-year-old exile probably, right? So it's this protector that learned to like, I'm going to bake a cake for, every for some reason we were talking, I was thinking this in your story, I'm like, and she's going to bake a cake for everybody. I don't know why, yeah, but I was sure. like, okay, so, so you're going to still bake a cake for everybody, which is fabulous. I like cake. Everybody likes cake. It makes everybody happy. But the problem is it's your six-year-old protector that's still doing that. And the poor exactly. thing is exhausted and she's only six and trying yeah. to run your, you know, 30 yeah. year old life or, you know, exactly. Whatever. Instead of having that adult self-led conversation, which is, you know, whether it's to your partner or to your friend, which is, man, there's a lot going on right now. And speaking on behalf of your own need, which is, this is scary for me. This conflict is hard for me. This, um, this thing that's happening in your life is here's what's happening inside of me. You know, and those are hard skills to learn as yeah. an adult. They yeah. really are. And especially, I think there's, especially this is where I think for women, there's that overlay of we've been affirmed yeah. for never making it about us. Yeah. And you know? so, right. And so there are other parts probably that are like, we have to keep that cake making part, right? Like the other oh, yeah. parts are like in support of the cake making yeah. part. <laughs> Um, well, the good news is we get self on board and the best of mm -hmm. you, our authentic self can be with all of these parts yeah. and listen to them and hear them and yeah. help them and unburden them so that there is more healing and we can then show up and attempt somehow to have adult healthy relationships. Yeah, we maybe. can. We really, we really <laughs> can. I know it's, it's, it's. It's a process. Trusting you. It's, I'm trusting you. <laughs> yes. No, it is. It is a process. And, um, but I do think when both people in particular, I talk a lot in the book about how I think in healthy relationships, whether it's friendships or you, it, it, it helps so much when both people are willing to do this work, when both people are willing, it doesn't have to be specifically IFS work, but at least willing to look at their own stuff. Because then if you're each willing to do that and each willing to bring that to the table, you, you begin a new pattern of having those hard conversations and it's not so scary. And even when you maybe get in and then you get into a routine and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, oops, we need to have those. You've done it before. You're like, oh no, we know how to do this. We know how to come together in this. And it's really beautiful. You know, it becomes that, that beautiful thing, but it is, it is, you know, healing yourself, learning your own. It's such a yin yang because we, we heal inside of ourselves, but also relationships are often, you know, the point of entry at which we begin to see what needs to be healed. Um, so we both heal in relationship, but then also we have to get off get, for me, get off for three days on a hiking trail <laughs> to get back yeah. in touch with myself so that I can go back into the relationship. Yeah. And the relationship is um, all all the trailheads, like all the trailheads are coming oh. up because of the real, because of the relationship, because of the relationship, all the trailheads. And you're right. If oh, I stay God. in it, if I stay in the, in the relation, you know, if I stay in that and all the trailheads and not don't do the space that, you know, either doing my own work or journaling or working, you know, then, or going for a hike, then 
I'm, I stay so blended with all those parts that they don't That's get any right. space to be with me so that I can really, you know, work on all the trailheads that are, that are coming up. Exactly right. It's a dance of, I would say it's a dance of, of dependence and autonomy, right? I it's love both. That. Yep. It's yeah. Both. We need both. I love that. That's beautiful. All right, Allison, last question. Um, if you were not doing all you're doing, <laughs> what would you do instead? Oh, I remember you asked me this last time. I, I always, my, I think I probably answered the same. The places where I felt the most calm and the, just the most pure joy was uh, theater acting. You did, yes. Yeah. I think I said that. And it is, it's like a sanctuary. And I think it's because it's where my parts get to be seen, but through another character. And so it's sort of like home base for me where, because it is hard for me to be, be visible. There, you know, there's very genuine parts of me that are shy. There's very, it's weird. A weird mix of both shy, gentle, and a lot of bold, you know, I put myself out there a lot, you know, and it's, and so for me being on the stage is sort of this perfect mix, which I'll never do, but it, I did it for a couple of years and it was really fun, but it's this perfect mix of both being seen, but not actually really being seen because you're doing it through a character. Um, it's kind of the place where I think my parts have all felt the most at, at peace. Um, so anyway, that's probably my answer. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So um, the best of you is available now. Is it available now? The 13th. Yeah, 13th. Yeah. So it'll be available by the time this comes out, it'll be available. And you can get yeah. that wherever you get books. And then people can Everyone. follow you on Instagram. Your Instagram is fantastic. And your website. Do you want to give everybody that info? It's drallisoncook.com. Allison with one L. So, so that's my Instagram handle and my website. And yeah, it's a great, it's been a great, um, I like that. It's a great outlet. Yeah, it's fun. Um, anything else you want people to know about you? No, I love you, Tammy. This is, you're just amazing. And I love talking to you. I always feel like we're just, it's, we really are, you know, you say this on different podcasts, but with you, it's like, it's like we are just ourselves talking and I love that my parts feel very just a lot come alive with you they they feel very seen and very at home with you thank you so much <laughs> that means the world to me that means the world to me and you know I adore you thanks for having me thanks for hanging out with us today if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, like, all the things. My book is available at your favorite independent bookstore or all the places books are available. You can also visit my website, TammySallenberger.com, where you can download a free meditation on getting to know your should parts. You know there's parts of you who remind you of what you should be doing. They sound a bit critical at times. Yes, we all have them. You can follow me at IFS Tammy on Instagram and Twitter and the One Inside Facebook page. I'm so grateful for Jack Reardon, who created the new music. Jack is a graduate of Derek Scott's IFS Stepping Stone program. Thanks, Jack, for getting me. And to you, thanks for listening.